Welcome to Pursuing Quality Long-Term Care, an educational podcast for individuals needing long-term care and their families. Join us as we talk with national experts and advocates about strategies you can use in the pursuit of quality long-term care. In this episode, we are joined by Patty Ducaye, Texas State Long-Term Care Ombudsman, to explore the complex issues surrounding the ability to consent to sexual activity among long-term care residents and supporting a resident's right to intimacy and sexual expression. If you enjoy pursuing quality long-term care, consider making a donation on our website, theconsumervoice.org. Every contribution helps us to continue the production of this podcast. Hi, everyone. Today, we're going to be talking about intimacy and sexual expression. Sexual expression is a basic human right that does not go away as we get older. The right to freedom of sexual expression among aging populations, particularly residents in nursing homes, has proven a sensitive and sometimes controversial topic, particularly when cognitive capacity is in question. It can be hard to determine whether someone is engaged in a healthy sexual relationship or if something more concerning is going on. By federal law, nursing home residents are afforded multiple rights, many of which are relevant to sexuality, such as privacy, confidentiality, the right to make independent choices, and the right to choose visitors and meet in a private location. We are very excited to be joined today by Patty Ducaye, the Texas State Long-Term Care Ombudsman, to explore the complex issues surrounding the ability to consent to sexual activity among long-term care residents. We'll be talking about determining consent, including among residents with diminished capacity, protection from sexual abuse, and support of residents' rights. Patty, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, glad to be with you. So before we get started, we just wanted to talk a little bit about the content we'll be discussing today. We're going to be talking directly and explicitly about intimacy and sex. We don't plan to mince words. However, we do plan to do our best to be respectful with our word choice and terminology. So Patty, just to get started, what's the definition of sexual expression? Well, when I use that term, sexual expression, I'm thinking about two forms of sexuality, uh, sexual gratification that we get from actions like masturbation or physical sex with a partner, or acts of just that, that affection, holding hands, hugging and flirting and sharing a bed, kissing. Those are the kinds of things that come to my mind. Right. And so when we look at the rights that nursing home residents have, what, what rights do you see them having in regards to sexual expression? Well, you said it. Um, so it's great to remind remind the listeners that uh, we're thinking about privacy and confidentiality, the right to make your own choices. You're an adult, and that means you can consent to sex with a partner, Uh, the right to respect about your visitors. So if you have a partner that doesn't live in the same place you do, having privacy in that visitation. And um, really, that's the kind of crux of it all. It's, it's, It's not a a comprehensive set of rights. It's the same stuff we look at all day long when we're when we're here helping educate people who live in long-term care facilities about their rights as an adult and a citizen of the United States. Great. And so we know though that residents in nursing homes, there are often factors that contribute contribute to limiting their sexual expression. So can we just talk mm-hmm. about that a little yeah. bit? So of course uh, sex is is only okay if you are consenting to that partner act. And so if you're talking about physical touch from another Mm -hmm. person, whether that's sexual uh, intercourse, but also all the other forms of of touch that I mentioned before, that needs to be consensual. And the question of whether your cognition is impaired through some kind of disease or disorder is something that has to be considered when we're, uh, for a lot of people who live in long-term care facilities. Right, and so that's, I'm glad you brought up consent. That's what I was gonna ask about next. Um, how, 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 I mean, I guess it's not very different, but how do people in nursing homes consent to sexual acts and who sort of determines that, um, you know, what is considered a lack of consent on their part? Yeah, well, I mean, first and foremost, the resident should be the one uh, consenting. Um, Another person can't really consent for you when it comes to sex, but in a facility, 
because we know that there will be people with impaired cognitive functioning, there is a role that a facility is likely going to take if you have impaired cognition and your ability to consent to something like uh, sexual expression with another person is uh, is of interest to you. If you show interest in another person and um, that that's consent, if you can understand the decision you're making and the person that you want to engage with can understand what you're offering and whether they want to receive that. When that is um, just unclear, mm -hmm. then a facility has a very significant responsibility because they've got that job of like, protecting health and safety of everybody who lives in the building. And that means they, you know, awkwardly somewhat, but they do have to get involved in these to ensure that the person and people engaged in the activities together are both willingly um, and understanding the, the uh, whatever the physical affection is, that they understand what they're doing and, and they want it. And how is that determined? I mean, who else is sort of brought into that? Um, and I completely agree. Yes, like the consent comes from the resident, but in determining whether or not the resident gave that consent freely, how how does that play out in a lot of situations? Yeah, so um, there's going to be some primary decision maker in the facility who's kind of running their operations that relate to, to this issue. There should be a policy in a, every facility. Do we see it everywhere? No, but there should be a policy that really guides the facility decision makers. You're going to see someone from nursing staff who will be a big part of this because someone who understands the resident's functioning, if it is if it involves cognitive impairment, then they need to be involved in assessing that individual, looking at some pretty concrete measures that exist for determining someone's ability to reason and understand a decision. And um, nursing staff and social services staff are likely gonna be involved in those things. There's also this whole element that isn't so measurable, um, like a test for your, your understanding of things, but so it's understanding how someone responds and res uh, responds to another person who's, in, who's uh, you know, flirting with them or asking them to sleep in their bed together. How do you see and observe both people responding to that interest and does it look mutual and is there shared um, understanding and appreciation for what's being offered? Those softer things matter and they should be considered in the overall decision about what makes a person feel good and their ability to really engage in sexual activity or other forms of expression with another person. And so that that all makes a lot of sense. And I think, you know, when we think about this, ideally, it makes sense. Like you said, many facilities don't have these plans in place. No. Um, how, I guess, you know, what can happen if they don't have these plans in place or if staff aren't really ready for this? You know, to no. me, I'm thinking, you know, or I'll just let you start talking because you seem yeah. to. Yeah, yeah. No, well, no, I mean, what happens is you see messy things. You see kind of crisis and overreaction or uh, just people going with their guts about their own personal beliefs right. about whether someone should have sex with another person or should get to kiss each other, if two people should get to kiss each other. And then you've got all those problems of my own personal beliefs just interfering with what really matters. And what really matters is two people involved and whether they are engaging in a consensual relationship or consensual touch. Uh, so that's the danger of not having a, a method for responding when you have a concern about two people and their ability to both consent and then not training the people who need to be aware of how to respond, right. how to do this in a fairly neutral way so that there isn't any kind of shaming or, um, I don't know, other kind of negative responses. You really, you know, we want to we want to re respond to this opportunity and these engagements for two people very positively because it's natural for two people to want to cuddle 
have physical contact and to feel good being with somebody else who you're attracted to. And that's what we really have to kind of normalize in a long-term care setting. And so what happens when there are grayer areas? Um, you know, I mean, and these things happen in, in outside of facilities as well, but, you know, what if, you know, there is a resident who might have mild dementia, there might be, you know, a fine line with consent and the facility realizes that resident is engaged in sexual activity with someone other than their spouse who usually comes to visit them with someone in the nursing home. What happens or what should the facility do if a, an act that might be perceived as sexual to some, maybe not to everyone, but is being conducted in a public area? Um, how, how do we handle, and again, a lot of this is going to be training, and I realize a lot of this training might not happen everywhere, but, but what are sort of the best practices in situations like this? Great question with actually a lot of different pieces there because <laughs> sorry about that <laughs> <laughs> because uh, well it's probably real life um because I, I guess let's let's recap some things I heard you say sure you talked about two people engaging in a relationship when there's an outside visitor who's a spouse sure it, maybe for one or both um you talked about mild cognitive impairment through say um early early stages of Alzheimer's or some other form of dementia, that's an important factor. You also even mentioned that this might happen in public. And so those are elements that need to be considered in a long-term care facility. Mm -hmm. Is that is that activity with between two people or by one person appropriate in a public setting? Certainly, I think handholding and, and kissing and general forms of affection generally are appropriate in public, uh, and we need to help secure that option for people. But other forms of sexual expression would not be appropriate in public. They need to be redirected, and privacy needs to be found. The, the issue of someone who may have a liking for another person who is not their spouse uh, can happen. It can certainly happen, especially for someone who has dementia and may lose memories about who is their partner and find comfort and love from another person who they're now living near and with. Uh, and that is not uncommon. We have the great Sandra Day O'Connor, who is like, in my mind as a hero, uh, how she thought about her husband who was going through the journey of dementia and not really recognizing her anymore and finding love and companionship in a long-term care facility that he lived in. She accepted it and talked about it, which is like the most amazing gift to all of us who, who read about her experience because we need to we need to recognize and she did that he needed this companionship and it brought him great comfort and support and it made his life better when he was going through a lot of changes and 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 his losses of of memory and and her memories of her so that spousal piece is tough um i don't mean to diminish it but it's a reality that it can be Become confusing about who is really there for you to provide that physical affection that you right. long, might long for. Uh, when we talk about someone with dementia, any forms of dementia, we got to just look at the moment and the person. And we have to treat that really individually when you think about can that person express consent you know, either verbally or through other forms of communication and their response to the affection from another person. If they can convey that they like it and they want it, um, somewhat meaning and understanding of what they're doing, that really needs to be accepted. Um, and I would say an ombudsman who was asked about this and engaging in this would work to help the facility and anyone involved really find acceptance if it seems appropriate, even if it maybe triggers our morals um, and our personal beliefs about what's right and wrong. Uh, you know, it's not easy, but important for us to, to recognize the needs. That's a great answer. And that's actually really helpful. I think taking that in the moment perspective and looking at what someone can do and how they feel. So how does that change or does that change if a resident has a guardian 
um, if you know their their capacity is questioned in different aspects. Um, yeah. Um, well, everything's going to depend on really the specifics of that situation and what the 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 court order the let we'd call it letters of guardianship say about the guardian and their decision making authority. Certainly someone who has authority over someone's financial decisions doesn't have decisions about the, right. the person themselves. And uh, that really matters. But most, I would say most guardianship orders also don't really contemplate this. Uh, and, sure. our and our position is that we are still dealing with a human being who has a guardian and they still have a right to state their preferences and have those preferences considered and honored to the degree it is safe to do so. I know that like the professional guardianship services in Texas, they're required to train and understand the right to, I mean, they may not call it sexual expression, but the right to make those choices and to really give consideration to allowing those kinds of choices to be continued as long as the person in the guardianship can express understanding and approval and uh, agree to the relationship or the touch that's being offered. And I admire that. And I, I think it takes, it, it takes, um, I don't know, it does take education to really see that as a possibility um, and not to come from a place of fear that everybody right. has to be protected from everything and all possible um, disappointments that may come from a relationship. Um, you know, all of us as adults, you know, we take risks with our relationships too. And of course, we shouldn't ever be physically or harmed, but entering into a relationship with another person, you know, it's stepping out and um, recognizing that you might get disappointed um, or, uh, you know, you might break up. Uh, your your friend might choose a new partner. And all those things are potential realities when we engage in a romantic relationship. And that includes somebody lives in long-term care. No, that's, that's, again, really helpful. And, you know, it's funny because I keep, you know, you, you mentioned the word adult, and I think that is so important here. And that's so important to remember, because in my head, when I think about somebody who has dementia, you know, who, who maybe there is a fine line between what they generally can agree to or what they're doing, you know, I come back to what you said about being in that moment, I compare it to a 16 or 17 year old, right, for whom this is all very different and looks very different, you know, and so it's, you know, what that kind of brings me to is the role of family, if there is one and sort of how, I mean, of course, there is one in some ways, but the interplay of family and staff, because I can imagine that staff may often reach out to family over concerns or things they're not necessarily sure about. So I guess I'm wondering what what that might look like and how a family should in in the best case, you know, if they're, you know, at the point where they really have an understanding of this, how how they should respond. Thanks. Uh, so cannot diminish how complicated this probably feels for any of us who uh, might be thinking about it for our own family members. Yeah. I bet a lot of us haven't had any recent conversations about sex with our parents. Um, we may have never had <laughs> conversations <laughs> about sex um, and their sex lives with a parent. And, um, you know, we, so it could just be so awkward. I would say that by and large, what really should happen is if I am a consenting adult, I shouldn't be tattled on by a facility staff person to my adult daughter, son, or other person who's a contact, or my spouse, if I'm engaging in right. sexual desires with another human being that maybe isn't my spouse, or um, because it's really a matter of privacy. So the facility can often be struggling with that because, of course, they're thinking about, well, I have responsibility to your care and your health and safety and your family members who are my points of contact when you're hurt are also on my mind and facility staff are 
you know, kind of having to face that duality. But we always, when we're uh, consulted about these kinds of questions, we're always reminding the facility that their primary client is the person living there and their ultimate right. responsibility is to the person there and their rights. So maybe they talk to that resident about what relationship they're in um, or what they may be doing. But it's really, if this is a resident who can express themselves and make their decisions, then telling a family member is really pretty much off the table and would, would potentially, I would say, violate residents' rights. It is a different story depending on cognitive impairment and right. the depths of that cognitive impairment, you know, the extent of it. Great. Um, and so I guess my other question is, you know, if, if you do, if you're not supposed to notify family, and I say not supposed to, I mean, what I imagine happening maybe more often than a, than a scared staff member going to a family member is that invasion of privacy of a family member coming in and a staff member just saying to them, oh, your mom really likes this person or, you know, something like that. Um, but and it happens. It definitely I, happens. Oh, I, yes, I can imagine that happens all the time. Um, so where where do other health concerns come in? You know, when does it when does a doctor get notified or should a doctor be notified of a resident's sexual activity? And where does that come from if the resident isn't providing that information? So we don't I wouldn't say there's really a lot to go on legally, you know, regulation wise mm -hmm. about this. So I'll just say what what our position is uh, as a long term care ombudsman, and that is a medical professional, a, a doctor, is really only appropriate if we're if there's a, a medical condition that's affected by this, um, if there's a health concern that is outside the sort of social realm, uh, then perhaps a physician needs to be consulted. Uh, but I would think those would be pretty rare times when it comes to sexual activity, sexual acts, and certainly for for sort of the sexual expression forms that are that are more forms of affection, I rarely could imagine a reason why a doctor would be involved. Now, a doctor might have been consulted and discussed over a, a, an assessment of someone's cognitive abilities, mm -hmm. uh, their ability to reason and, and willingly voluntarily give consent. Uh, but again, that's, that's fairly limited or sort of a, a one point in time where that might consult might be appropriate. I, you know, one thing we haven't talked about yet that I want to mention is mm -hmm. not only is sex happening with two people who have a lot of physical ability that they can kind of engage in activity together uh, without assistance, there's also sexual activity that may be wanted about someone who needs physical help to be able to get into bed and be with another person if that's their desire or to physically have sex. And uh, as, as awkward as that can seem to, to somebody listening in, uh, we have seen the right responses from long-term care facilities, nursing homes, who understand they've got two consenting adults who may need physical help to be able to engage in sex together, and they see that as their responsibility. So uh, that may need to be a, an effort that really actually uses the sort of the care planning method of talking mm -hmm. about how to provide a pr private space for two people and what physical help they may need for getting together and also after they've had a sexual act together, helping them get clean and dressed and, and all the things that they may need for their physical lives and sexual activity is part can be part of their physical life. That's, I'm really glad you brought that up. I actually hadn't thought about it in, in that way, but I was about to ask you about privacy um, mm -hmm. because we know so many residents don't have their own space. Many people have roommates. And so what does that look like? And what is the roommate's role? Not necessarily with sexual intercourse, but with having another resident in your room and engaging in different kinds of activities. Right, right. Well, um, you know, it's sort of a question because so many people are going to have a roommate. It mm -hmm. sometimes is a question of uh, really talking with your roommate and deciding what they're comfortable with uh, while you're together. And certainly, I think 
it's fair to say that hearing people engaged in sex in my room, that a curtain between me is not going to be particularly right. comfortable for a lot of people. So, uh, it ha you know, sometimes these things have to kind of be scheduled. And that's the unfortunate part of nursing home life that something that may, you know, you'd otherwise really want to occur naturally and organically maybe has to be a little bit scheduled and planned. Uh, but if you share a room, having a, a strategy for giving yourself privacy from anyone coming in could be something as simple as a, a, a little note on the door that says privacy, please, that gives a signal for no one to come in during this time. And working that out with your roommate, those are strategies we've seen work in long-term care facilities. Another strategy can be if room is available in the building where there's a room that's actually can be requested for sexual activity to occur in so mm -hmm. that that room is sort of always off limits, um, always has a privacy sign on it, but it's maybe reserved for a day or for a time so that people can go there and not really disrupt their roommate's life. Right. And that also, you know, I mean, you mentioned earlier the care plan. I was thinking, um, you know, going back to what we said in the beginning, or I think you mentioned, you know, sexual intimacy is not always between two people. You know, if we're talking about masturbation in a room where there is a roommate, you know, I mean, I think all of these things have to be, you know, sort of thought out beforehand. And I think, you know, I was going to ask you a question sort of about what, what people think about when they think about sexuality in nursing homes versus the actual reality of that. Um, and I mean, I think people just imagine it doesn't exist. I mean, I for agree. the most part. Um, and the reality, it seems, is quite different. Do we have any idea of, you know, not not just necessarily sexual intercourse, but how much intimacy and activities going on in facilities versus sort of this perception that there's nothing happening? Not that I know of. I don't know of any research about, about how much activity is going mm -hmm. on. Um, only that in, so, in a lot of research, there's certainly good evidence of positive aspects of sex, just like it is for anybody living anywhere, <laughs> um, that there can be really positive effects to sexual expression. And that what, 50% or, or greater than 50% of people living in long-term care facilities say they want to find intimacy or sex uh, or sexual expression. They want that in their lives. So yes, there may be people opting out, not interested or not finding someone they want to be with. They may, they may not have um, interest even in masturbation, but we can hear from at least half of half of the folks in this study I'm mentioning who say they want it. And uh, we, you know, we want to make sure they have the privacy and the respect that they deserve. Sure. And and along with that, my last question was going to be what your your estate long-term care ombudsman, your um, what what is the role of the ombudsman and the ombudsman program in all of this? Well, you know, we're think about the long-term care ombudsman. We are a resident directed advocate. So if a resident wants us to help them mm -hmm. um, express themselves sexually, we were going we we will help them. And um, so it needs to be really driven by the individual. And so that means we got to remind ombudsman that the likely event that a facility may call us and say, oh my gosh, what am I going to look what just happened and I don't know what to do that we need to remind facilities and continue to stay in that role as resident advocate yes we can we can help remind you well what policies do you have about this and remind the facility to take a look at them we can take a look at facility policies and uh, raise questions if we feel like something's antiquated or you know misleading about about what the facility would do in response to a concern and give them advice and information from good policies like from the Hebrew home, uh, which is just renowned for having good long-term care facility policies about sex and sexual expression. And then we're just gonna have to say, you know, our job is to listen to what residents want and help them exercise their choices and their rights. We'd be happy to be be there if you want to talk, but it's going to be if the resident wants us there. So I'd say those are our functions. We might help train 
a facility on some of this material and help them think through what is a good response and what's acceptable and what, what residents should expect from the staff who care for them. That is also a great answer. Um, thank you so much, Patty, for joining us today. This was a great conversation, and I think it will be helpful to a lot of people who are not thinking about these things on a regular basis. Um, and I think for family members who, you know, my, my thought would be, because I can imagine us at Consumer Voice getting phone calls from family members upset that they might have a loved one engaging in sexual activities at their nursing home. And I think this is a really good reminder that all of this focuses on the person and on the resident. And it's not really about how you as the adult daughter or as the spouse feels, but it really is about the resident experience and their rights. So. Absolutely. And I, I will say that I know there are plenty of family members out there that are delighted to hear <laughs> that their parent or their spouse have found comfort and found a new, a new partner. Um, and so it, it, you know, it, our reactions and our responses can go run the gamut. And right. I'm, I'm delighted when I hear that attitude coming from family members that, you know, recognize that this is a privacy and a right and really see it as something beneficial for the person they love. So I uh, appreciate the conversation and glad to be with you and uh, hope we can be a resource to folks in the future. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye. Thanks for joining us on Pursuing Quality Long-Term Care. This podcast is a program of the National Consumer Voice for Quality Long-Term Care. Make sure to visit our website, theconsumervoice.org slash pursuingquality, where you can subscribe to the podcast, follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and find more information and resources. If you enjoy the podcast, please rate, review, and subscribe. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next episode. Thank you.